Hello, and welcome to the recorded version of the Aquatic Plants and Health Association. This material was originally presented to the Audio Lake Association's Area Council meeting on My name is Sarah McLeod Nielsen, and I am the Surface Water Quality Coordinator at the Rita Valley Conservation Authority. The following will provide an overview of the situations of local lakes and their stress rates. We will also look at the role of aquatic plants in these lake environments, as well as some of the causes regarding nutrient levels and the ways that of aquatic plant growth. For a bit of background, in 2014, a collaborative project was initiated to examine the reports of increased algae and aquatic plant growth. This project was funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. Collaborative members included Friends of the Tay Watershed Association, Carleton University, Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority, and the Valley Conservation Authority. The research component of this project sought to investigate the effect of climate change, nutrient loading, and zebra mussels on the lakes, with the key objective of understanding how water quality has changed as the lakes have become developed, and if zebra mussels have affected aquatic plant growth. Aquatic plants are a key component of the lake ecosystem. Audi Lake has an important warm and cool water recreational fishery. This fish community relies on aquatic plants throughout various phases of their life cycle, including reproduction, feeding, and cover. The Audi Lake Association has done an incredible job over the past several years investigating time and resources on a large-scale fish and wildlife habitat enhancement project in partnership with RBCA. For more information on this project, please see the resources section at the end of this presentation. In order to understand how lakes have changed in the past 150 years, sediment cores were taken from the bottom of study lakes, as shown in the slide. Diatoms, which are single-celled algae with silica cell wall structures that are uniquely identifiable and are well-preserved in the sediment. Diatoms are diverse, with each species having a narrow range of tolerance to environmental conditions. By looking at the change in diatom communities, researchers are able to understand ecosystem changes that have occurred. Most of the lakes have little to moderate change in their diatom communities, indicating that water quality has remained fairly consistent. Most of the change in the diatom community that did occur suggests slight nutrient enrichment and warmer water temperatures. Overall, the lakes were determined to be in relatively good shape. Once a lake becomes eutrophic or nutrient enriched, it is very difficult to reverse that trend. Therefore, it is important to make sure slow trends continue and conservation efforts remain in place to build resilience and protect existing water quality. This next chart looks at the relationship between zebra mussels and aquatic plant biovolume. The red vertical line in the center separates lakes without zebra mussels on the left from lakes with zebra mussels on the right. Lakes are ordered on the horizontal axis by increasing total phosphorus concentrations. The box plots show the distribution of plant biovolume in each lake. Biovolume is the measure of the percent of the water column occupied by aquatic plants. A green arrow has been used to identify Audi Lake on the right hand side. Every one of the study lakes had areas where the biovolume was 0% or had no plants to almost 100% at which plants could grow right to the surface of the water. It has been suggested that plant biovolume values of 40 to 60% are ideal to support fish habitat without being a nuisance to lake users and boaters. Overall, lakes with zebra mussels were found to have significantly more plant biovolume than lakes without. This next slide looks at the relationship between plant biovolume and nutrient concentrations. Total phosphorus concentrations are shown on the horizontal axis and plant biovolume is again shown on the vertical axis. The red dashed lines show the boundaries between the three trophic classifications of lakes, oligotrophic or nutrient poor, geotrophic or nutrient rich. Plant biovolume was found to be greater in more nutrient rich lakes. Researchers noted that areas with very high levels of plant biovolume may be characterized by stands dominated by Eurasian water milfoil. Eurasian water milfoil is a submerged invasive aquatic plant. This aquatic plant is found in many of our lakes and is able to outcompete native species to form extens extensive dense stands. Lakes with both the zebra mussels and higher total phosphorus concentrations had more plant biovolume. As well, these lakes had more sites with 100% biovolume, which is the greatest nuisance to lake users. 
Invasive species and nutrient enrichment are two of the factors that we can try to control to help reduce nuisance stands of aquatic plants. The following slides will provide some information for property owners and lake users. Overall, it was found that the majority of change in lakes was determined to result from increased water temperatures. This leads to a longer growing season for aquatic plants. Zebra mussels increase water clarity and available sunlight. When coupled with good nutrient availability and a good growing season, the result is favorable conditions for the aquatic plant community. The relationship between these factors and others can be found summarized in the Algae and Aquatic Plant Education Manual. A link to this document can be found in the resources slide at the end of this, this presentation. It also provides information on the role aquatic vegetation plays in the ecosystem, as well as what different species you are likely to find in local lakes, as well as some of the causes of algal blooms and nuisance plant, nuisance plant growth. Also provided are actions that can be taken to protect lake and river lake and river health, as well as resources to help landowners or community groups to implement various types of projects. The next few slides will look at the different types of aquatic plant communities and the role they play in the lake ecosystem. Native aquatic plants are very important to the lake environment and provide many advantages, including improved water clarity as plants trap suspended material and hold sediment on the lake bottom. Plants help prevent shoreline erosion from wind and wave action as they add roughness and help dissipate energy. Plants, particularly those species that are floating plants, protect against algal blooms as they use nutrients from the water column that would otherwise be available for algae. They are an essential food source for various aquatic and terrestrial species. Plants are an important contributor to the release of oxygen in both the air and water. As previously noted, they are an important habitat feature providing shelter, breeding, and nesting sites for many species of insects, fish, and animals. Natural, uh, natural variability was observed throughout our study lakes, with areas ranging from 0 to 100% plant biovolume in almost all lakes. The lake environment itself plays a very important role in what type of aquatic community will be established. If you have areas with gradual slopes from shallow to deep water, and a lake bottom that is mud, silt, sand, or a combination of these, there are much more suitable growing conditions compared to a bedrock slope. Areas that are protected from wind and waves, such as a sheltering point or an enclosed bay, as well as areas with nearby marsh or swamps, are likely to be indicative of having the conditions necessary to support growth of a robust aquatic plant community. Though plants are an important part of the lake ecosystem, there are disadvantages associated with excessive aquatic plant growth, such as the smothering of breeding and nesting sites, though this is generally associated with profuse algal growth. Excessive dead plant matter can also cause anoxic conditions that can be harmful to other species. When plant material dies, the decomposition process consumes oxygen, and this reduces the amount of oxygen available in the water column for other forms of life. Abundant growth is an indicator of nutrient-rich aquatic ecosystems. They can create unsightly aesthetic conditions. Dense stands can impact recreational use of water bodies. I'm sure everyone's had a propeller that has been entangled with vegetation and made boating difficult. Plants can also choke water pumps and foul beaches and boat launches. Aquatic plants are needed to maintain an ecosystem balance. When growth is limited, there are some negative impacts that may also occur. An algae-dominated system may develop. Habitat availability is also reduced, resulting in a less diverse wildlife community due to lack of shelter. Additionally, breeding and nesting sites may also become very exposed. Aquatic plants are an important food source and provide necessary nutrients to the aquatic system. As previously noted, removal results in less protection from shoreline erosion as plants provide roughness to, dis to dissipate energy from the wind and wave action. Invasive aquatic plants are an important contributors to excessive aquatic plant growth. Some of the most common ones that you are likely to encounter locally are Eurasian water milfoil, European water chestnut, European frog bit, curly leaf pondweed, yellow iris, purple loosestrife, and flowering rush. Eurasian water milfoil is specifically problematic. It forms very dense submerged stands that can make boating or recreational activities such as swimming very difficult. Eurasian water milfoil is found in many local lakes. European water chestnut and European frogbit are floating species. 
European frogbit is also found locally. Recently, RBCA has partnered with the Otter Lake Landers Owners Association in a removal project that has seen some positive results. Presently, European water chestnut is found in one portion of the Rideau Canal in Ottawa. Yellow iris, purple loosestrife, and flowering rush are all emerging species introduced as ornamentals. They are very difficult to remove and seeds can be easily spread during removal. As noted earlier, reducing nutrient inputs and controlling invasive species are two things that lake users can do to help protect local water bodies. I know most are familiar with the phrase best management practices, which are important to protect the lake. The same is true when looking to manage aquatic vegetation growth. This includes maintaining a natural shoreline buffer with native trees and shrubs. Buffers are very effective at filtering runoff, erosion control, and providing stormwater management by slowing down the flow of water, all of which reduces nutrient input from runoff. Buffers also provide habitat for shoreline species and shading and cooling in the riparian zone. This is important as we see evidence of warming trends in our watershed. Additional activities include effectively managing invasive species, having properly maintained septic systems, and employing sustainable drainage options whenever possible. Low impact development is another term you may have heard for sustainable drainage. These features may include a rain garden, soak away pits, grassy swales, permeable pavers, or even ensuring downspouts are just directed away from your waterfront. The objective is to reduce the amount of runoff and promote infiltration into the ground. In a natural forested setting, only 10% of rainfall runoff directly enters the lake. When this area has been disturbed, such as by development, runoff increases to 55%. So the idea is to get as much water as possible infiltrating back into the ground and minimize the amount of runoff that comes over land. Going back to the list on the slide, using phosphate-free soaps, ensuring that any organic material such as leaves or brush piles are set back at least 30 meters from the water to prevent them from entering the lake. Ensuring pesticides or fertilizers are not used close to the water and watching your lake when boating. When boating within 30 meters of the shoreline, your speed should be lower than 10 kilometers per hour to minimize the erosional potential from wind and wave, from wave action. Respecting a 30 meter setback from the water and keeping your environmental footprint small to preserve natural conditions as much as possible. Lastly, preventing the spread of invasive species, including plant species. In recent years, there's been a lot of focus on reducing the spread of zebra mussels in our lakes, which is very important, and most of the same methods can be used to limit the spread of other species. Ensuring all boats, equipment, recreational gear is clean when moving from one water body to another is critical. This needs to be considered for weekend visitors, renters, and even your own personal use. All items should be cleaned in water greater than 4 degrees Celsius, either scrubbed or soaked for at least 10 minutes. An alternative is pressure washing an item, such as a boat or trailer, with water of at least 250 PSI. If the piece of equipment is not being used again soon, you can let the equipment dry, such as a canoe, in the hot sun for five days to kill any aquatic invasives before moving to another water body. In some cases where aquatic plant stands may become problematic and restrict recreational use or navigation, aquatic plant removal may be necessary. This may require a permit and generally falls under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forests or Parks Canada in the case of properties along the Rideau Canal system. The following information has been obtained from MNRF's website. Please refer to the appropriate ministry's resources to ensure you have the most up-to-date information before proceeding with any work. Information links are also compiled in the resource sections of this presentation. If you are looking to remove invasive aquatic plants, no permit is needed under the Public Land Act if you can meet all the following criteria. If you are the property owner or conducting work on their behalf, work may only be conducted on the, directly in front of your property. Ensure that you can minimize the removal of any native vegetation and dispose of any removed plants or material on dry land more than 30 meters from the water to prevent it from re-entering. Any wheeled or tracked machinery must be stored on dry land, a barge, or vessel, and only mechanical devices such as a rake or cutter bar or hand pulling can be used to remove plants. You cannot dredge the bed of the water body. 
do not carry out work during the fish spawning season or during the time of other critical fish life stages as set out in the in water work timing window guidelines, an example of which is highlighted in green on the slide. If you need help determining the appropriate period, please contact your MNRF district office. If not all these conditions are met, can be met, a work permit from the ministry is needed. The application is available on their website. The next slide highlights the appropriate area where work can be conducted directly in front of your property. To confirm your property extends to the water, refer to your property survey. It's also a good idea just to let your neighbors know what kind of work you are undertaking to minimize any potential concerns. In removing native vegetation, the rules are very similar to those for invasive vegetation with a few additional requirements. Again, a work permit is not required under the Public Lands Act if all of the following can be met. Work can only be conducted on property south of the line shown on the map as Schedule 2. This is shown on the figure by the gray line. Audi Lake, for example, falls within Schedule 2. Again, you must be the waterfront property owner or conducting work on behalf of the property owner, and work may only be conducted on the shorelands directly in front of your property. This slide shows where work may be conducted, including the maximum removal limits. This will be addressed in the following slides. As with, it, as with invasive plant removal, any plants and materials removed must be stored on dry land to prevent it from re-entering the water, at least 30 meters from the water. Any machinery that is used must be stored on dry land, a barge, or vessel. Only mechanical devices such as a rake, cutter bar, or your hands may be used to remove plants. You cannot dredge the water body. There are maximum areas that may be cleared with respect to native vegetation. Dimensions are shown outlined in green on, in the green box. If your property frontage is more than 22 meters, the maximum width of swimming and boating area that can be cleared is 15 meters. If the property frontage is less than 22 meters, a maximum width of 8 meters can be cleared. These two diagrams provide a summary of limits to be cleared with respect to property frontage. Lastly, work cannot be carried out during the fish spawning season or during the time of other critical fish life stages, as outlined in the in-water work timing window guidelines. Again, this is highlighted in the green box. If you have any questions regarding how this may apply in your water body, please contact your MNRF district office. It should also be noted that approvals may be required from additional agencies, including Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Transport Canada, the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, your local conservation authority, municipality or township, and other provincial ministries, and Ontario One Call. These are all, all outlined in the MNRF guidelines for both invasive and native aquatic plant removal. Regarding aquatic vegetation removal, hand pulling or raking is a preferred method for removing plants. If it's decided that vegetation must be removed, many species such as invasive Eurasian milfoil are able to spread through vegetative propagation. This is when new plants can grow from cuttings of the stem, leaves, or roots of the original plant. As a result, cutting can temporarily reduce stands, but these new plants may grow from cuttings that remain in the water and may actually enhance future spread. Overall, reducing nutrient inputs and maintaining a healthy native plant community at your shoreline is the best way to prevent invasive species from establishing and proliferating. Thank you for your time today. This last slide provides an overview of resources should you be looking to learn more about aquatic plants and their impacts on local water bodies. These include the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority, there's a link to the Algae and Aquatic Plant Education Manual, the Landowner Resource Centre, the LRC, and the Audi Lake Fish Habitat Improvement Project. Under the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, there is a link to both removal guidelines for invasive and native aquatic plants. Other agencies include the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, Parks Canada, and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Thank you very much.